joy in the city joy in your life joy in your family and joy everywhere in jesus name gck authority has announced the next level move from the land of honor and integrity comes two in one gck live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you because you brought us to the conclusion of this Congress. We bless your name for all the things we have heard, all the things we have seen. And we thank you for the revelation you have given our hearts. We thank you for the vision you have also given us. We bless your name, Lord, because we know that you have a good thing in heart for every one of us. And we pray that all that you have for us, nothing will hinder the fulfillment in Jesus' name. We know that it is in your hand to change, to transform, to equip, to saturate, to empower, energize, and also send into service. And we're praying, O oh Lord, that as we have had this intention, you will still fulfill in every life in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that as you speak your word to us, we'll receive your word. And as we receive your word, this word will have a transforming effect and power in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Bless us, O Lord, today and help us so that we'll do everything necessary so that we can be channels of blessings unto other people too. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. As we come to the conclusion of this uh, year's Congress, I am talking to you on the topic, Go, Be Fruitful, and Multiply. Go, Be Fruitful, and Multiply. In Genesis chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that keepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. There we have the first commandment of the Lord related to being fruitful and related to multiplying. And yet you need to know all the things surrounding those verses we have just read. This wasn't just the desire of man. It was the desire of God himself. It was what God himself purposed that he will do. In fact, it was the very purpose of the creation. Before the creation of the man and the woman, God had said, let us make man. And then he had said that man will be the crown of creation because that man 
or the man and the woman will be in the image of God. That talks about holiness and righteousness. And then it says, after the likeness of God. And after that, they will have dominion over the sea, over the air, over the land, over the vegetation, over the animals too. Which means they will literally have dominion over the universe. And then it says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. What he had said he will do exactly that he did. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And when he created the man and the woman, he now blessed them. And in blessing them he said, Be fruitful and multiply. In telling them to be fruitful, they were to reproduce themselves. They were to reproduce not a carnal nature because they didn't have a carnal nature at that time. Not a sinful nature. They didn't have sinful nature at that time. They were to reproduce themselves in the very image that they had been created. They were to multiply, fill the earth with the same kind of people that have been made in the image of God. But then as we look at this, we know that there will be things that will have to happen before they could be fruitful and before they could multiply. One thing we know before that will happen is that between that man and that woman, there will be fellowship. We know that between that man and that woman, there will be love. Between that man and that woman, there will be a coming together. And between that man and that uh, woman, there will be the desire to have exactly what the Lord wanted them to have. They couldn't stay separated and still have the fruitfulness and the multiplication and the reproduction of themselves. Therefore, we see that there would have to be a condition or some set of conditions that will be fulfilled if that multiplication of the fruitfulness if it was to take place and uh, you know that it is out of that law that god had said that we now have the billions we have on the earth now the multiplication are taking place the fruitfulness has actually been achieved after the flood the lord gave that same command and showed that same purpose and desire filling up the earth, multiplying like he said unto Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9, reading from verse 7, And you be fruitful and multiply, and bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. You see the flood are taking place because the antediluvians, the people that lived before the flood, they lived such a corrupt, carnal, condemned life that the Lord said he'll wipe all of them away. And after that had been done, he now spoke to Lot and his family. And he said, my original plan still remains. Although there were only eight now, four men, four women, one to one, a man to a woman, God repeated the injunction again, the desire, the purpose again. And he said, be ye fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth. And then he repeated the word multiply, multiply therein. Which means the Lord still wanted that to be fulfilled. The fruitfulness and the multiplication. But now we're talking about spiritual fruitfulness. We're talking about the multiplication of uh, the Christians and the disciples and the babes in Christ and the people that know the Lord. How will that happen? Well, I've told you already. That before the physical multiplication, the reproduction of 
boys, girls, babies could take effect. The man and the woman will have to come together. On the spiritual side, how do we reproduce? How do we have comforts? How do we have the people that turn to the Lord? There will be a coming together between God and man. Because, you see, the man alone cannot do it. You cannot save the other fellow. You cannot bring into the kingdom of God the other person without the help of God. On the other hand, although God can get people saved without you and without me, yet he had decided that will not be his method. That although he could do it, he will not do it without man. And that's why the Bible says we're laborers together with God. There will have to be fellowship between Christ and the church. Love between Christ and the church. Interaction between Christ and the church. Prayer from the church, answer from Christ, before the Lord will bring about that multiplication and fruitfulness. And that is what we're now considering. That if we're going to multiply in the Christian fold, if we're going to bring about the new birth, the conversion of multitudes of people to the point that there is a multiplication because it took place in the early church, then there is going to be that unity or union between Christ and his church so that together we can bring forth fruit unto God, fruit in the kingdom, and the disciples can multiply. Let me just show you uh, one or two scriptures to tell you that it has happened before and it ought to be happening now. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. I'm reading a part of verse 1. And in those days... The number of disciples was multiplied. That's the part I want to show you that it happened before. The number of Christians, of converts, of disciples, of learners, of followers of Christ, they multiplied. In verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. It had happened before that the number of disciples actually multiplied. If that is the case, why is it that today there are places where the number of disciples is not being multiplied? We're not having great conversions. We're not having the fruitfulness that we ought to see. Well, examine number one. The reasons for spiritual fruitlessness. The reasons for spiritual fruitlessness. Then number two, if we have seen fruitlessness in our fellowships, and we see that people are not turning to the Lord, at least in their large numbers, and real spectacular conversions are not taking place, what can we do? What steps can we take? So that there will be that fruitfulness and multiplication of disciples as in the early days. That leads me to point number two. Steps to fruitfulness in service. Steps to fruitfulness in service. Once that has started taking place, how can we make sure that that thing will continue? Point three, consecration and continuity with Christ. Consecration and continuity with Christ. Let's see, number one, why is it today that the fruitfulness we expect, we are not seeing it on every campus, in every fellowship, among every group of people saying that they belong to the Lord. Why is it, we may ask, were spiritually barren. No new babes are being born in the fellowship. No new converts are getting into the fellowship. And the people who were there before, it appears that even the zeal is not there. The understanding is not there. 
the dominion is not there the power is not there how we see that the original purpose of god in creation and in the new creation is not being fulfilled right now that is in short what are the reasons for spiritual fruitlessness in john chapter 15 john chapter 15 verse 5 i am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth in me and i in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing without me ye can do nothing remember christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride and the bridegroom is telling the bride that without me the bridegroom you cannot have converts you cannot have babies in the kingdom you cannot have the new ones to enter into the kingdom of god without the husband the wife cannot have children normally legitimately and without the bridegroom without christ we the church we cannot have uh, the children we ought to have in the kingdom of god without me ye can do nothing now as we put this into pass before we bring the pieces together it means number one if we do not know christ within the fellowship ourselves if we were only to be nominal christians the people that have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof if we were to be people that profess we know god but in works we deny him if we do not have the real genuine bona fide experience of salvation then we cannot be fruitful we cannot multiply because there will, be, there will not be that spiritual power within us to reproduce in second timothy chapter 3 and verse 5 second timothy chapter 3 verse 5 having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away if we only have the form of religion we have the gimmicks of religion we have the motions of religion we have the activities of religion but we do not have the transforming power of christ in our lives and we're not real disciples and real converts and real children of god with the nature of god implanted into us and the life of christ manifested through us then we cannot be fruitful without me as your savior without me as your redeemer without me as the one who has combated you and changed your life ye can do nothing when it comes to reproducing and bringing children into the kingdom in titus chapter 1 verse 16 they profess that they know god but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and to every good work reprobate once again we need to understand the reason for fruitlessness in the various christian fellowships or communities today if the people there only know the name of god they only know the backside of god they only know the bible stories we read in the bible but they do not know the power of god that changes life and they deny him in their behavior in their conduct in their work and they are abominable and disobedient and reprobate that is disqualified metals that are of no use to no purpose then they cannot have real spiritual children in the kingdom of god so then the number one thing we need to take care of is to make sure that we are born again and to make sure that all those who are coming to the fellowship they are all born again because it's a born again assembly it's a born again group is a born again fellowship that will have this intimacy and relationship and fellowship with the lord jesus christ and then christ and his church will be able to bring 
souls into the kingdom. It says, for without me ye can do nothing. But is that all? Is that the only reason why some people today are not fruitful? No, that's not the only reason. Matthew chapter 27. Rather, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 58. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Here we have an illustration from the action of Peter. He followed Christ, but then he was following afar off. And if we're not in intimate, close, inseparable relationship with the Lord, we cannot bear fruit. If we're following the Lord, but at a very far distance. If we're following the Lord, but it's not close enough. It's not intimate enough. In our quiet time, in our prayer lives, in our thinking and uh, believing, meditating upon the word of God, in our obedience to the word of God. If we're living at the periphery, if we're living far to the center of the real gospel, and we're living far away from Christ, although we're not totally in the world, if we're not completely, entirely in the kingdom, then we cannot bear that fruit. And we see Peter here, he was walking, he was following Christ, but afar off. And eventually he sat with the servants of the high priest. If we're too near to the world, if we're too near to the people of the world, in the way they act, in the way they behave, in the way they plan, in the way they think, in the way they do what they do, then we will not be able to bear the fruit we ought to bear. Not only that, if we do not have our lives, our hearts saturated with the word of God, because the Bible says we are begotten by the incorruptible seed, by the word of God. And if that incorruptible seed, that word, is not filling us and saturating us, how will we be able to be a fruit? Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4, reading from verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast, re thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Now you can see here what the Lord was saying. That we will not be able to occupy the place of priesthood unto him. If we do not have the word of God filling us, saturating us, influencing us, and cutting off everything that needs to be cut off in our lives. It says, thou shalt be no more priest unto me. Then he also says, I will forget thy children. The reason he said that is that those children will not be spiritual children. Those children too will not have the word of God in them. Those children too will not have the nature of God in them. They will not have the unity, the fellowship. They ought to have with the Lord with them. Because of that, he says, I'll just count them as ordinary children of society. I will reject them. And the reason for that is, number one, the lack of knowledge. Number two, the rejection of knowledge. Number three, the forgetting of the law of God. So then, you see the reason why some people are not bearing fruit. Number one, it may be that they are not even born again. Number two, it may be they were born again, but they are backsliding. Number three, they might not have totally backslidden. They may be following Christ afar off. Number four, they may be so near to the world that eventually they are influenced by the thinking, the planning, and uh, the psychology, the philosophy of the world. Number five, it may be that they have 
neglected the knowledge of the word of God. It may even be that they have gone to the point of rejecting the word of God. It may be that all the lands of the word of God before they had forgotten. And as a result of all these things, they will not be able to bear fruit. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 25, it says not, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If we are missing fellowship, we'll not be having the revelation we ought to have, the insight we ought to have, the fellowship we ought to have, and we'll not be having the vision that we ought to have. And because of that, we may not be bearing the fruit we ought to be bearing. Also, we may lack vision from on high. You see Paul, the apostle, who really bore so much fruit and got so many converts and wrote so many epistles, he said, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. Yeah, that man was a man of vision. As a result of that vision, he really bore fruit and the disciples multiplied. In Proverbs chapter 29, Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That is, the people in your community will perish if there is no vision. If you do not have the vision of preaching them, and if that vision is not dropped in your heart by the Lord himself, and if that vision is not being nursed every time, by the hand, by the power, by the Spirit of God, by a constant, continuous revelation of the state of those people, the need of those people, and the part you have to play. If that vision is not being constantly nursed, you will not be able to bear the fruit you ought to bear. And then it may be that it's because we are prayerless, and because we are not praying, we do not have the converts we ought to have. We are not bearing the fruit we ought to bear. Now when I say we are prayerless, we may be very much prayerful, but the prayers we are praying are not related to having converts. The prayers we are praying may not be related to missions work. The prayers we are praying may not be related to getting people converted, coming to the kingdom. We may be praying about things that are so personal. We may be praying about things that are of little value, of a little consequence. But the kind of prayer I mean is found in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. That's the kind of prayer that will make us bear fruit. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's a messianic psalm. And it's talking about the Messiah. And if the church, the bride of Christ, will pray, then the heathens will be converted unto Christ the bridegroom. Now that we have known the reason why we are not bearing fruit, what are the steps that we need to take? so that we will bear fruit. And if we have been bearing fruit, so that we will bear more fruit. We go back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. From verse 1. I am the vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. It's not Satan that will take him away. Neither is it a man that will take him away, but God himself. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That proves the lie of the people that say that once you are in grace, you are always in grace. 
Once you are born again, you are always born again. They say that after you are born again, you can never be lost again. Because you will always be there, no matter what you do. But Jesus Christ himself said, Every branch in me. That is, those who have been born again, if they are not bearing fruit, the fruit made for repentance. The fruit of righteousness. The fruit of holy living. And of course, also the fruit of uh, bringing converts into the kingdom. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now he says, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That's what the Lord does so we can bear more fruit. He will correct us. He will chastise us. He will purge us. He will cleanse us. It will separate from our lives the things redundant usings that not ought not to be in our lives. He will burn off the chaff in our lives that ought not to be there. He does all that. The correction, the chastisement, the purging, the cleansing, the cutting off, the separation, the burning of the chaff. He does all that so that we can bear more fruit. And it is actually the love and the mercy of God that makes him to do that so that we'll be able to bear fruit. It's just like uh, the, uh, the woman that may have fibroid. And uh, because of that extra tissue, because of that extra object in the body that may not even be paining her, although sometimes it pains, that the doctor will need to take away so that the woman will be able to have children for the husband. It's the same thing that God is saying, that if there is any object that is sapping your energy, any object there that is taking part of the thing that is spiritual in your life, and then is sucking everything out of you, you are not able to bear fruit, the Lord will purge. The Lord will cut off. The Lord will burn. The Lord will remove from you so that you'll be able to bear more fruit. It says, every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, he cleanses, he cuts something off again so that it may bring forth more fruit. In verse 4, abide in me and I in you. It's in fellowship with him will bear fruit. It's in togetherness, intimacy with him that uh, will bear fruit. It's just between the husband and the wife. As long as they are separated, how can they have children? As long as one is living in this city, the other one is permanently living in another city. How can they have children? It is by coming together. Abide in me, I in you, that you will be able to bear fruit. And therefore, if you want to bear fruit, you should be asking yourself, am I abiding in Christ? Is he prominent in my life? Is he present in my life? Is he living in my life? Am I living in him as well? That's in verse 4. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. He continues this in verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. You will see the emphasis there, remaining in Christ, walking in Christ. Walking by the word of God. Living by the word of God. Everything you do, everything you say, the way you dress, the way you carry on your friendship, in the private and in the public, you are living according to the word of God. That is how you bear fruit. Some people think we bear fruit only because we preach 24 hours of the day. If that were possible, no, not at all. If you are preaching so much, but your life is not a life abiding in Christ, 
and Christ is not abiding in you. And we cannot see the evidence of that Christian life and Christ occupying and living within you. You may preach all you want to, but there will be no fruit because it is the abiding Christ within that actually brings the fruit. And then he goes on in verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. The plan of God, the purpose of Christ in choosing us, is that we'll go. We'll bring forth fruit, and then our fruit will remain. But then understand that it's based on our abiding in Christ. In Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. The people that bear fruit are the people that know that they owe the world a debt. They owe their community a debt. And they're not thinking, well, I'm doing some favor to my community by preaching to them. They say, this is something I owe that I must pay. They, are, they realize I'm not preaching because I want to please uh, the leader in the fellowship. This is the debt I owe that I ought to pay. I am not doing it so that uh, the leader in the fellowship or the executive will be able to say, yes, we're doing well or the non-student worker will be able to press us. No, not at all. This is the debt I owe, and I ought to do it. And the Lord is watching me. And Christ said, the bridegroom is watching me. And the Spirit of the Lord is nudging me all the time, saying, pay your debt. Pay your debt. Pay your debt. You owe that man the gospel. Give it to him. You owe that lady the gospel. Give it to her. You owe that lecturer the gospel. And as long as you are keeping your mouth shut, you have not paid your debt, you must pay the debt that you owe. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. And then in verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Those words, I am ready. There's so much in those words that we do not have uh, the time to be able to even explain fully. But let me just say this briefly. If we do not know the contents of the gospel, can we say we're ready to preach the gospel we do not know? If we know the contents of the gospel, but the contents of the gospel is not set on fire within our hearts, and we say we are ready to preach the gospel. If we know the content of the gospel. And if we have the fire within our souls burning. But we have not mastered the language of communication. Communicating to the Greek. Communicating to the philosophers. Communicating to the wise. Communicating to the, uh, to the enlightened community. Communicating to the logical minds on the campus. Communicating to the people that are self-proclaimed atheists. Communicating to the agnostics and communicating to those people that have read beyond their intelligence. And they do not know who God is, where God is, what's our responsibility to God. If you do not have any convincing message to those academic people, can you really say you are ready to preach the gospel? Maybe you are ready to preach to the farmers. Maybe you are ready to preach to the one on the street. But if you are not logical yourself, if you are not an intellectual yourself, if you are not a person that develops yourself academically, if you not know, if you do not know about how to intelligently present the gospel to the people that have read science and have read a lot of their evolution and their cosmic things and all the various things they are talking about, and they talk in the language of evolution. They do not know about, uh, about uh, the, the, the creation 
and they think of the continuity and they are thinking that uh, you know the universe had been and a light that travels from this place to this place it has taken billions of years before it came to this world don't have an answer them and they tell you that those rocks and uh, the geologists have told us that it has been there for many thousands of years and they are talking of hundreds of thousands of years and you are saying that from the bible perspective the world is only say, about six thousand years old and they laugh at you and say it's because you are ignorant it's because you don't know geology it's because you have not examined all those stratas and all those things that we scientists have examined and we know that this world is hundreds of thousands of years old and there you are you do not you're still reasoning like a farmer yourself you're still reasoning like a villager yourself can you then tell those uh, people philosophers and scientists telling them i am ready to preach the gospel unto you no you may be a christian but you are not ready yet and you may even know a little bit of the bible but you are not ready yet you may be able to witness to the uh, primary school people and uh, the person in the market, uh, but you are not ready yet to preach the gospel on the campus. And you know the problem now? The problem is that even those who are supposed to stu uh, be students, they are becoming like uh, audio uh, or visual or media people. What I mean by that is that we are turning this generation into an, a kind of electronic generation. And people don't read anymore today. Even you find the students on our campuses, and the Christian students are not an exception. Electronics has taken over. They are either listening to music, or they are listening to a cassette, or they are watching a film, or they are watching something the habit of reading is dying out on the campuses. And if you cannot read, you cannot take that science books and know about creation. You cannot take uh, that other thing and look at all the things they are saying. And you cannot look at all those uh, Darwinian theory and everything because you are a Christian and you want to present the gospel to them. And you are just there, you are just, you know, a Christian that knows John chapter 3 verse 16. And even now to convincingly pass that across to the academic community that you do not know. How then can you say, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are on the campuses? Many of us are not ready. How do, you how do you confront a mathematician? How do you confront a scientist? How do you confront a person that has studied political science? How do you confront the person that has studied all the things that are happening in many countries of the world today? And they are telling you that if God is there, why this? If God is there, why this? How do you explain uh, the natural disasters that are taking place? How do you explain all the other things? How can you take this Bible, the Word of God, and then stand be before academic community and then convincingly give it to them that all their questions will be fully answered? Brothers and sisters, if we have not developed ourselves to that point, we're not ready yet. But then Paul the Apostle said, I am ready. Being ready is not just that, well, emotionally, I am ready. Emotionally, I'm willing to go to that campus and go and talk to them. It's not emotion, it's knowledge. It's the intellect. It's the ability to read. It's the ability to take all the arguments of all those philosophers and all the people that are opposed to Christianity and be able to stand Take all the things they are saying, put everything into pieces, puncture holes in them, and throw it to the ground, and then bring the gospel in a masterful way that the people will know that you are not just a preacher coming from the farm, you are living with them on the campus there, and you speak the same language they speak, and then you are able to bring them, draw them, pull them, attract them into the gospel. I believe it's possible. I said, I believe it's possible. That means that we will have to then change a little and begin to read. 
instead of just being electronic, uh, you know, community, and only listening to cassettes, only listening to music, you now develop yourself, you discipline yourself, and you actually read. If I were to give you a simple test here, and I would say that how many of you have read a single, serious, a Christian a literature a, that is like a book, a novel? How many of you have read from the very first page to the very last page? I'm talking about serious matter. I'm talking about serious material. I'm not talking about the tracks. I'm not talking about, you know, the little, little books with uh, uh, normal reasoning and clear reasoning and a little illustration that almost anybody that has not gone to university can read. I'm talking about heavy material that you pick it up, Christian material that is supposed to challenge all the people that say that they are intellectuals. When last did you pick a book like that and you straight through from chapter to chapter with the grammar, with the vocabulary, with the illustrations in science and everything and convincingly you, you are able to assimilate everything and pour it out to the people that are willing to listen to you. Since when? How long? In fact, uh, what I discovered today is that even a uh, uh, deeper life uh, campus fellowships we invite a lot of people on the campuses to come and preach. And some of the people we invite to come and preach on the campus, some of them don't have good grammar. Some of them will be making mistakes in the use of past tense and present tense and continuous tense. Some of them, they do not know simple conjugation of verbs. And uh, if we have listened to them outside, and they are able to jump, and they are able to shout, and they are emotional. Oh, we just tell our executive and tell our people. Oh, we say, I know somebody in the, that, that local government. He loves the Lord, and he sings the Lord, and he can, you know, really preach. And then we invite him. And then as we invite him, he comes. Even the point, you know, at the point he begins to uh, preach. He's already making grammatical mistakes. And the people we invited there, they look at our faces and say, these are your preachers here on the campus. And then while they are preaching, uh, then they bring illustrations. And while they are using that illustration, they bring Yoruba language proverb into it. They bring a do language and proverb into it. They bring Igbo into it. They mix everything together. Then they just say, just love the Lord. Well, I came here, I know you are university, but I don't know grammar. I just know Christ. Well, then stay in the village. If you don't know grammar, why did you come to teach us at the university? You must know grammar. If you are coming to teach us. Oh, there are a lot of people in literacy in the village you can go to. There are people on the street you can go to. Because we're, we're inviting professors. We're inviting lecturers. We're inviting doubters. We're, invi we're inviting the people that do not believe that the Bible is the word of God. We're inviting people that can argue. We're inviting people that are intelligent and intellectuals. And if we bring a village person that he will announce at the beginning of his message, well, university people, here am I. I don't know grammar. I don't know anything. I only know Jesus. Well, say the village will meet in heaven. We may not be able to meet on the campuses. You don't know our language. You stay outside. Let's get in people like Paul. People that, you know, will stand there and then he will look at that society there and know that those mathematics people are there, those scientists are there, political science people there, those uh, people in administration there, those who are in the uh, communi uh, communication they are there, the media people they are there, the theater people they are there, the language people they are there, those who are studying those literatures, ancient and modern, they are all there, those who are picking up all those authors, they are all there, and then you give him that topic and he has prepared, and I'm not talking Talking of you know all these kind of topics you are giving the people you are inviting to the campuses and talking of real topics that match the academic community and talking of topics that when a person on the campus sees that a topic that this is what we're going to talk about 
and you just see creation or evolution and you paste that on the board in the science department all those people are going to say yes i'm interested i'm going to listen to that thing evolution or creation is it continuity or catastrophe now what we mean by that if you have studied all those things is that the evolutionists they say that everything has continued normally and that's why they calculate and they say it has taken this years and this years and this years and then we on the other side is why said no it was not continuity's catastrophe that at a point in time god created and then wiped it out with a flood another catastrophe took place which is the flood and we can give you scientific proof and we can give you the data we can give you from archaeology we can give you from all the analysis of the geologists and everything and show you that the flood actually took place we can refer to all the materials and then bring everything together and by the time we wrap everything up all and professors will be coming to the lord amen, amen. we're going to do it i said we're going to do it it will take reading it will take study it will take prayer but it is going to be done it is then we'll be able to say i am ready at, as at present we're not ready but thank god we're getting ready i said thank god we're getting ready i am ready to preach the gospel to you that at rome also in verse 16 for i am not what i am not what i am not ashamed let me ask you a question if a preacher comes to you on the campus and then uh, after you before he counsels or before he uh, does the preaching uh, the professor or somebody says uh, I want uh, you know to talk to your preacher. I don't know whether I will be able to wait after the message because uh, I have a lecture, I have tutorial, I have a lab work to do. Therefore, let me talk to him now. And uh, you call the preacher. You say, uh, uh, Professor so and so from that department wants to get your attention uh, before you eventually preach because he may not be able to wait at the end of the meeting. And eventually, uh, the professor just said simple, simple things that uh, we have this uh, problem and uh, my wife was operated upon and because of the poor anesthetics and uh, all that, uh, she went, uh, you know, to the theater and all that and uh, the preacher that he's talking to said, anesthetics, uh, what is that? Uh, I know aesthetics, but anesthetics. Which one? What's the difference between aesthetics and anesthetics? And the professor then understands the kind of person he's talking to. And then he says, uh, well, then the professor uh, cleverly looks at his time. And so, I'm sorry to even keep you. I know that, you know, you ought to be preaching now. And uh, let me release you. Maybe if I have time, I'll see you again. And the professor shook his head and said, look at them. Those are the people they, they show. He doesn't even know simple, basic things. And then he walks away. You say, eh, Sir, are you not going to wait? Uh, well, I'll see you later. And then eventually, when we know what has happened, we will be ashamed. We'll be ashamed. If we're not going to be ashamed, let's do our homework. Let's know about the people we're inviting. Let's know the level of preaching on the campuses that we will know that this is real campus work and the things we're dishing out there, we're giving out there is really at the level of those people. And then we'll be able to say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I, I believe we'll do it. I said I believe we'll do it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's a man of consecration. That's a man of dedication. That's a man that really knows that 
this is given unto me, this is my life, this is my calling, it must be done, it will be done. And then he says, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Well, our time is gone. Let me just uh, talk about consecration and continuity with Christ. Consecration and continuity with Christ. There are many passages we can refer to, but we don't have the time to do that now. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. From verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. But unto him which died, which died for them and rose again. He wants us to be fully consecrated, committed, abandoned, surrendered, yielded unto him. That is now that he died for you. He has been given unto you. You now want to surrender yourself. Absolutely yield yourself. Consecrate yourself to the cause of the gospel. That's how we'll bear fruit. If we will just say, I don't care for any other thing. I just want the Lord in my life. I want the power in my life. I want the ability to be able to convincingly give them the gospel. I want my life to back it up. I want the power of the Holy Ghost to you to make it effective. I want to fully consecrate everything I have for the publishing of the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel. That's the only time we'll really be able to do it. It takes consecration. It takes continuity to in John chapter 8 and in verse 30 and verse 31. John 8, 30 and 31. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, if ye continue in my word, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. What the Lord is looking for is continuity. And come back to the illustration of marriage once again. If a uh, husband and wife, if they get married, but then they do not continue living together, they do not continue in fellowship, they do not continue in communication, they do not continue just interacting together, that the two shall be one and they remain one. How can there be a fruit? It takes continuity. And so if we're going to be a fruit, we must continue with the Lord and continue in the word of the Lord. The Lord has taught us much uh, since we came on Monday night. And I'm sure that we have really heard the word of God. Am I right? And we have prayed and quite a lot uh, they happened. Even the things I said this morning before my message, that was part of what we needed to hear. Everything God is giving us like that, is to shape us and sharpen us and saturate us and help us and lead us in the right direction. The Lord has really spoken much to us and I believe that we really can be approached. Do you believe that? If we will look at all these reasons where we are not bearing fruit, take all those things away and then take, get into the steps of fruitfulness in the service of the Lord and consecrate ourselves, surrender ourselves, submit ourselves, abandon ourselves, commit ourselves unto the Lord, and say, Lord, I am going to continue. I will not allow anything to draw me back or drive me back. I will ever be with the Lord. I believe that great things are going to happen through every one of us in Jesus' name. What uh, we need to believe and what we need to look at is, uh, I don't think of the past, Today is the beginning of the future. And therefore, if you just tell the Lord, Oh Lord, whatever happened in the past, now I really want to follow after the Lord, the seriousness that I need, the commitment that I need, the consecration that I need, and the devotion that I need, the study of the word that I need, the prayer life that I need, the kind of life I need to live. Whatever happened in the past, I want to start right now. 
and things are going to be different and I'm going to bear fruit. I am going to bear fruit. Are you going to bear fruit? We are going to bear fruit in Jesus' name. And our fruit will abide. I just believe that if we will let go and let God. Let go anything, everything in your life that may not be according to the perfect will of God. And let God fill your heart. Take over your life. Lead you and guide you. And do whatever he wants to do in your life. I believe that we will turn our campus upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be able to accomplish great things and do exploits for him in Jesus name our lives will convert people our language will convert people our preaching will convert people our praying will convert people our fellowship will convert people and great will be the fruit and great will be the converts that will come through us into the kingdom in Jesus name these campuses are going to be touched they are going to be transformed Things are going to begin to happen that never happened before. Let's rise up on our feet and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. It will be done. It will be done. It will be done. If you will just uh, take all those things that were pulling you away before, take away the prayerlessness. Take away the head knowledge and have real knowledge of the Lord. The lack of vision. And whatever it is that has not made us to be bearing enough fruit, let us lay every sin before the altar of the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. It can be done, it will be done. We can do it and we will do it. We will bear fruit. Our fruit will remain well abide. Get the fire in your soul before you go. Get the vision in your spirit before you go. Lay everything upon the altar. God had used other people in the past. He can use you. The Wesleys started on the campus. At Oxford University. If God had done it through such people like that, He can do it through you. Get on fire. Get on fire. Lay yourself upon the altar of the Lord with everything consecrated unto the Lord. Don't let any little chaff, any little useless, worthless things clinch on your life. But you just tell the Lord, I'll be completely sold out to the Lord. Sold out to the Lord. Sold out to the Lord. If I need to study, I will study. If I need to know how to address the campus community, I will do it. If I need to become a diligent student of the world, and diligent study of my community, I will do it.
God can use you, my brother. God can use you, my sister. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If he can take over your life, take over your ambition, take over your desires, take over all your plans, take over all your time, he can do something through you that has not happened on the campus before. He can do it and he will do it. He can do it and he will do it. Just rise up as a soldier of the cross. Rise up as a soldier of the cross. Discipline yourself to pray and to study. If you are losing the habit of reading, get that habit of reading back again. Read good materials. Good materials. Good materials. That will challenge those on the campus. That will drive them to the Lord and drive them on their knees. If you are university people, I institution people, you cannot continue to talk like illiterates. You cannot continue to communicate like illiterates. Study and pray and prepare yourself. It's not just anybody that can read the campus community. Develop yourself to do it.